Hey guys, welcome back to Bob Mup Chem. It's the second video in our Unit 5 thermochemistry set. And in this one, we're going to be looking at measuring enthalpy changes and also calculating the enthalpy changes from those measurements. So let's get stuck in. So before we have a look at that in this lesson, quick question to review what we did in the last video. Pause the video, have a go. Okay, great. Well, we know if we have the products having a higher enthalpy than the reactants, we can draw an enthalpy level diagram, which means we're going to see the difference between the reactants and the products being a positive value. So the answer could be A or C in this case. And we know if we have a positive delta H, then we are going to be taking in energy from the surroundings, so it's endothermic, giving us the overall answer of A. So now that we want to go about looking at calculating these energy changes, we're going to need to introduce the term called specific heat capacity, or C. So this is simply the amount of energy required to raise one gram of any substance by one degree or one Kelvin. Different substances have different values. For example, water has the value 4.1 joules per gram per Kelvin, whereas copper has a much lower value of 0.385 joules per gram per Kelvin. Now, all this means is that the lower the value of C for a substance, the higher the temperature change that we will see given the same energy input. So for example, it takes 4.18 joules to raise one gram of water by one degrees, whereas it only takes 0.385 joules to raise one gram of copper by one degree. Now, this is important in a concept called calorimetry. So calorimetry on a fundamental level is a method for measuring the amount of energy that is given out or taken in by a given reaction. At the most rudimentary level, all you really need is an insulated cup with an insulated lid and a thermometer. So the insulation keeps as much heat in as possible and the thermometer allows us to record a change in temperature of the reaction inside. Effectively, what we do is we use a reaction to heat water and then the temperature change is measured. And this is important because if we know both the mass of the water that we've heated. We also know the specific heat capacity of water, which is always 4.18. And we know the temperature change, then we're able to calculate exactly the amount of energy and therefore calculate delta H. So we can link these all together with a simple equation. That's delta H equals Q over N equals MC delta T where enthalpy change or delta H is the change in enthalpy per mole for a reaction. And that is given in kilojoules per mole. We have Q is the enthalpy change of the reaction, usually given just simply in kilojoules. N obviously standing for a number of moles as it does in our other units also. Mass in this case is specifically the mass of water that is used. So it's really key that we focus on the mass of water. And I will mention the assumption. I'm going to mention a few assumptions in a moment, but I will mention now the assumption here is that the density of water is given as one gram per centimeters cubed, which is actually only true at four degrees. But for our calculations, we're going to always assume that. C is specific heat capacity, which we mentioned previously. Now it's going to be the specific heat capacity of water, because remember, we're focused on the mass of water, which is 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Again, I've given these all as the kilojoule units, but if you multiply them by a thousand, you just get the joules per gram per Kelvin. And delta T is the temperature change, which we give as T2 minus T1, where T2 is the final and T1 is the initial. You will have to watch out when you're doing these calculations for 
looking at if T1 and T2 is to do with the temperature of the water or the reaction itself. And that will be based on which type of question you're approaching, but we'll cover that in this video. Beyond the assumption I mentioned about the density of water, there are a couple of other assumptions that we have to account for that make these calculations a little bit more simple. Beyond the density of water, we are going to have to assume that all the heat from the reaction has been transferred to the water. So when we do our calculations, we're assuming that that is the complete amount of energy produced by the reaction. The next assumption, which kind of builds on that other assumption, is that the maximum temperature that is given by the reaction is an actual measure, an accurate measure of the heat evolved by the reaction. So we're assuming effectively no heat loss in this way. And finally, when we're calculating the mass of water, we're also going to assume that any aqueous solution has the same specific heat capacity as water. And we can usually justify that last assumption based on the fact that water specific heat capacity is quite a bit higher than most other substances. Time for a couple of quick questions before we start the calculations. First question then, define calorimetry. Pause the video, have a go. Pop em up. Of course, calorimetry being the techniques that we use to measure heat transfer in reactions. Next question, write the equation for calculating enthalpy change and state what each term stands for. Pause the video. Pop em up. Remembering we've got delta H equals Q over N equals MC delta T and all of the values given as we did before. So I'm going to go for you a few worked examples of the types of questions that you might expect in the IB. The first of those questions is the enthalpy of solution questions. And this is where we're calculating the energy change for dissolving one mole of a solid into water. So we've got a question here giving a mass of a substance. It gives us the volume of water in a coffee cup calorimeter and it gives us a temperature rise and asks us to calculate the rest. So let's have a look at how we can go about that. With all of these questions, our Q equals MC delta T is going to be a key component of calculations. So we can see because we have 25 centimeters cubed and we assume one gram per centimeters cubed, we're gonna have a mass of 25. And remember, it's a solution so we're going to use the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.18. Now, when it comes to change in temperature, we see there's a temperature rise of 3.8. So we would expect this to be T1 minus T2. So we would expect T2 to be 3.8 Kelvin larger than that of T1. However, in a situation of a temperature rise, we know that that energy has been given out by the reaction to heat the water up. So in the situation of where we've got a reaction heating the water up, in this case, dissolving the sample, we're going to almost switch T1 and T2, or even more simply, just take the negative value of the temperature change. In this case, that gives us minus 0.397 kilojoules, However, that's not the end of the question. We still need to account for the number of moles used. So we're going to do that value divided by the moles, which is going to be mass over the molecular mass here of lithium chloride. So the mass used was 1.15 grams and the molecular mass of lithium chloride is 42.39. So then if we take the original value of energy we got in the first part and divide it by that value there, then we'll end up with the energy per mole, which is minus 14.6 kilojoules per mole, which makes sense because it's exothermic. So in this next example, we're going to be solving for temperature, another type of question. And it's about a cooling of a certain amount of ethanol. Now, as usual, we're going to start with Q equals MC delta T, but this time we're going to rearrange it to give us delta T. 
which equals Q over M times C. So we're going to take our value. Now, here we see ethanol is releasing energy. So we're going to take negative energy, 40 grams of the sample, and we're going to take the value of C, which is given to us in the question as 2.46 kilojoules per kilo per Kelvin. So delta T is equal to negative 30. Now, we want to remember that delta T is equal to T2 minus T1. So in this case, negative 30 is equal to T2 minus 50 because the temperature it starts at is 50 degrees. So we just rearrange to get T2, which is of course 20 degrees. Now in questions where we're asked for the enthalpy of the reaction, we're going to have to have the added step of finding our limiting reagent as in this reaction here. Now, in this question, it tells us that the iron powder is in excess, which makes determining our limiting reagent easy. And so when we calculate our moles in the second part, we'll use our values for copper sulfate. First things first though, we're gonna set up our Q equals MC delta T. Mass is going to be 50, because we've got an aqueous solution. We're gonna assume that it has one gram per centimeter cubed. C, remember we're using an aqueous solution, so we're going to assume the specific heat capacity of water of 4.18, and the temperature increases. So remember, when it increases, that means the water has increased in temperature, but the reaction has lost energy, so we're going to pick negative 10. We're going to take the opposite, which gives us minus 2,090 joules. Calculating our enthalpy change, we just have to work out our number of moles, this time using C times V, which is 1 times 0 0.5, which is of course just 0 0.5. So we're going to do minus 2090 over 0 0.5, which is equal to minus 4180 joules per mole. We usually quote these in kilojoules per mole, so we're going to have 4 0.2 kilojoules per mole to two significant figures as that's what the values are given in. In enthalpy of neutralization questions we're actually going to be adding two solutions together so we have to watch and account for both our limiting reagent and make sure to get the correct mass so it adds just maybe a little layer of complexity. However just like our previous examples we're going to start by building Q equals MC delta T. Now remember our mass is going to be got from the total amount of the solutions, which in this case is 400 centimeters cubed. Again, we use 4.18, the specific heat capacity of water. Now, delta T is going to be 30 minus 24.5, or so it may seem. However, because this is the temperature rise of the water, we've got to bear in mind that the reaction is actually losing that energy, just as we did in the previous examples. So because it's losing the energy, what may initially seem like 5.5, we actually take to be minus 5.5 because the temperature is lost to the water to increase the temperature of the water. We then solve for that, which gives us 9,196 joules. And it's asking us for the enthalpy change of neutralization. So again, we're going to determine our limiting reagent. Now we can see we've got sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid at a two to one ratio. However, with the concentration of sodium hydroxide being one mole per decimeter, it's quite clear that sulfuric acid is going to be our limiting reagent. We're then going to solve for that, which is going to be 0.4 multiplied by 0.2 which equals 0.08 moles and just as we did in the previous examples we're then going to divide what we found in the first part by the number of moles which is going to end up giving us 114,950 joules or 115 kilojoules per mole if we solve to three significant figures. So we've covered some of the main type of questions that we might encounter, although not yet looked at processing data, which we'll look at in upcoming lessons. So let's do some questions on that then. First question, calculate the energy required for two liters of water to go from 20 to 99.7 degrees when heated in the kettle. Pause the video to have a go. 
pop them up. Okay, so we of course going to set up our Q equals MC delta T. We've got two liters here, which is 2000 grams, 4.18 as our specific heat capacity and delta T, we're gonna do 99.7, take away 20, which is gonna leave us with 666,292 joules or 666 kilojoules to three significant figures. Next question then, 750 grams of just boiled water loses 78.45 kilojoules of heat as it cools. What is the final temperature of the water? Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. You guessed it, we're using Q equals MC delta T and rearranging to find delta T, which is Q over M times C. So we just plug in the values. So we had our delta H or Q value as 78.45 kilojoules over. Now I've got kilojoules, so I'm gonna go convert my mass into kilograms, which is 0.75, multiplied by our favorite number 4.18, the specific heat capacity of water, and we get delta T equals minus 25. And now we're just gonna solve for T2, which is going to be 75 degrees. Now for the last question, we're gonna do an enthalpy of neutralization question. So remember, you need to find your mass and temperature in the question and the equation has been given to you as well. Pause the video and take your time. Bop them up. So hopefully you remembered, you can't really go wrong with Q equals MC delta T. From our question, you've got 200 centimeters cubed of each of your solutions. So our mass is gonna be 400 times the specific heat capacity of water multiplied by delta T, which is 30 minus 24.5. Now remember with the temperature, this is a raise in the water temperature, which means the reaction lost this energy and transferred this energy to the water. So we're gonna take the negative value, which is negative 9,196, and then we're gonna determine our limiting reagent. Now we can see that hydrochloric acid is obviously gonna be our limiting reagent as it's a one-to-one -one reaction in the equation and hydrochloric acid is gonna have less moles. We're gonna calculate that using C times V, which is 0.16 moles. Calculating delta H, remember, is Q over N, which equals minus 1196 over 0.16, which is going to equals 57,475 joules per mole and 57.5 kilojoules per mole to three significant figures. So there will be a practical to accompany this with practical workbook and some questions that include analyzing data. For now, just try these questions. Thanks for joining me, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. And as always, practice makes slightly better.